Hello, everyone, and hello, Amit. Hello, Doc. A new conversation about an interesting topic today, which uh, basically touches on myths and mythologies. And in order to cover that, you suggested a uh, popular video that was done, uh, a conversation with Joseph Kempel. He was probably one of the most popular uh, comparative mythologists of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, comparative religion uh, scholar. He passed away in 1987. And in the last two years of his life, there was a very, a very popular series of interviews made, uh, which was called uh, The Power of Myths, I think. Yeah, right? myth, think. myth and Mythologies. Myth and Mythology, yeah. The Power of Myths. Uh, this was uh, a series that was uh, done by Bill Moyers, that was the name right. of uh, the journalists. And interestingly, yeah. there's a website, billmoyers.com. I will leave it in the comments. And this website contains all the transcripts of this video series. So even if you're not able to find the videos uh, on some sketchy places on the internet, uh, you can find the transcripts of uh, all the conversations of Moyers with Campbell on the site. For people who don't know him, Joseph Campbell was uh, famous for his um, concept of the hero's journey. And probably he will be the most unforgettable for influencing George Lucas for his Star Wars <laughs> <laughs> saga. <laughs> Even if the name is such will go down, but this contribution will never be forgotten. Yeah. By the way, he's available on uh, Amazon Prime if uh, you have okay. to pay for it, but he has okay. six series um, for $2 each, if anyone is interested. Yes, so I will leave the link uh, in the link yeah. in the descriptions for all of this. Um, yes, so those conversations took place at the um, mid ed end of the 80s, uh, at the end of a life that covered basically the second half of the 20th century. Uh, of Joseph Campbell, and uh, we will see how this is relevant because he speaks in a very specific way that I think today would not be done anymore. Uh, or it would, right. it would maybe we find this kind of language from spiritual seeker, see, uh, teachers, Advaita teachers, or something like this, but uh, not so much from scholars. I think that would be very unusual today. Right. Um, okay, so that's a basic introduction. We will, of course, not be able to cover everything. We focus on one specific episode. I think it's the last one. Yeah. A series called The Mask of Eternity. Yes. I think he, here he talks about circles and, you know, um, how everything is a circle, yes. how life is a circle. So, yeah, it's Masks of Eternity. Okay. And we, from that, we picked a few topics. And uh, in this conversation, I can give my comments and I would be also interested in your perspective on that, Amit. Perfect. Okay, so um, as you said, Doc, so I'm gonna be going over some of the points I picked from this episode, right? And obviously I have a lot many points, we can't go over all of them. Um, some of them are too philosophical for us to debate on. So we, we picked up, or as we had discussed, we picked up three topics that we wanted to touch upon, right? Mm -hmm. One is his mention of eternity and how he mentions the moments that we are spending right now with our loved ones um, are eternal, right? So we wanted to discuss a little bit more into that and maybe if you can take us into a deconstructive way of understanding it. Um, the other one we wanted to talk about is Brahman and how he mentions about Brahman and what Brahman actually means. Yes. And the third one is around purpose of life, right? So in discussion with my friends, um, they were more curious to listen about purpose of life um, and then get into uh, eternity and then Brahman, right? So I think we're gonna go the reverse order if you're okay with it. So we'll start with the purpose of life. Um, I'll ask you some questions around purpose of life, and uh, then I'll let you tell me what you thought he meant by purpose of life, uh -huh. right, in, yeah. in the episode. So uh, we'll focus on that. Okay, so 
getting started with it. Um, so the purpose of life, right? Or lack thereof. Um, mm-hmm. So with me, I've been working with you for three and a half, four years. I don't even remember how long. Um, and for the good part of the first two to three years, I struggled with purpose of life. And I read all kinds of books, young, um, Adlerian, and Stoicism, right? To find out what my purpose of life was. And then I was unsuccessful in finding it to the time I came back and I said, okay, there is no purpose of life, mm-hmm. right? Um, but it took me a long time to get to it. Now, mostly what happens is if you pick up any book or you listen to any of the podcasts, they keep talking about purpose of life. You work with a purpose of life. You need to have a purpose to life. You know, there is a purpose to life. And it is really confusing for people to or maybe it is really tough for someone to understand that there is no purpose. And in this episode, um, Campbell was talking about there is no purpose to life. There is only um, there's only a way to find what your inner light, um, you know, it is, it is way of talking. Mm-hmm. Inner light defines how you should live. And if you are unhappy, then you're most likely not living your life that way. Mm-hmm. And for you to be happy, you should live your life as per your definition. Yes. So my question to you is, what do you think of the sole purpose to life? I kind of have a clue, but I'll let you explain. And the second question I have for you is, is it true that you can identify what your inner light or inner self or guru or whatever um, mm-hmm. people call it? is telling you versus the voices in your head? Like, how do you distinguish it? Um, and in general, what you think about it as well? Okay. Uh, I will be a little bit frustrating to you, I'm afraid, because I will counter some questions. Why is it such an important question? Why is it such an important question? Yeah. Why do the purpose you talk of life? about it? Why is it, why is it a thing, the purpose of life? Uh, Okay, let me give you my spin on that, right? So I'm just thinking out loud. Um, When people are very happy, right? This is what I was listening to one of those Sadhgurus or whoever on YouTube. Mm -hmm. When people are really, really happy, no one questions the purpose of life. They're really happy. They're enjoying. But the time people question purpose of life is when they've taken an alternative route, right? Um, Like to give you an example, in my case, we decided not to have kids. Mm -hmm. So now the question is, okay, you follow the life principles, you went to school, you worked, you got to a certain position. And now what? Now do you keep doing what you're doing? And if you continue doing what you're doing, where do you stop? What is the point? Where am I headed? Right? And that's when the question comes that, okay, maybe I was born for a certain purpose. And that's when you get tripped on it. And then this is one example for my case, but then there are other things where you watch videos, all these um, you know, life gurus and everyone, and they keep talking about, you can discover the purpose of life, live the purpose of your life. So a lot of people are fed that there is a purpose of life and they need to seek that purpose mm-hmm. of life. And I think that's why it becomes important in my view. Okay, so I hear two components in your answer. One, mm-hmm. uh, a kind of FOMO, a kind of fear of missing out. So yeah, you can say that, yeah. And then I'm kind of astonished. What? You have not found your purpose of life? What are you doing? (laughs) And then it's like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know I was supposed to (laughs) tell me about it. Apparently everyone has it and I don't have this precious thing. Exactly. There is the FOMO aspect there. And the other one uh, that you pointed out in the beginning uh, of your answer is, it's a kind of a symptom that I'm not feeling well, that not everything is in place. Mm -hmm basically assuming that when I'm well, I don't, yeah, maybe I talk about the meaning of life and the purpose of life, but over a bottle of wine and kind of in a fairy, airy fairy philosophical way, but not really interested, not really desperate. The people are super interested in it would be the implication there. They don't feel well, they're looking for something. And Mm -hmm. then the purpose of life becomes a, um, a, a shell, a placeholder, a signif- an empty signifier, if you want to put it uh, linguistically. So it's supposed to mean something. Uh, it's the, you know, in, in movie language, the Mac- MacGuffin. I don't know if you heard the term. No, I haven't. Uh, the MacGuffin in movies is 
kind of we have to find the three stones you know the three stones and in order to get there we have to go to africa to find a clue and then we have to go to south america to find a clue and in the end you know to find the actual three stones is just the last minute and then the movie's over it's all just an empty thing to keep you going to have a story right right so it could be that the that um, the purpose of life is a macguffin something that keeps us kind of keep you moving so, on. so so but then is that is that the same like let's say people who follow the script of life right yeah. you you are go to school then you go to college then you study for college then you get a job then you continue mm -hmm. seeking to grow in your career yes. in the midst of it you have kids then you're worried about your kids their college education they go to college they bring a lot of drama you're busy with the drama yeah. and then you're like 65 70 you retire and you're like okay now i'm gonna relax um, if you follow that pattern, I don't think a lot of people would question purpose of life. I mean, I don't know. I don't have kids. I, I don't know. But I see my friends who have kids. They don't sit around questioning it. They have no time. But if you do deviate off of that route, then these kind of questions come up because now you have a lot of time and you realize by just working endlessly, it's not going to bring you too much happiness. Yes. Uh, so... There is an interesting implication there. It's as if people who lead a normal life, I don't like that notion so much, but as if people who lead the normal life also follow a promise of fulfillment and purpose. It's if there is an unspoken kind of dogma that I follow, as if someone told me, you know what, the purpose of life is to work, be family oriented, to have children, have a career and retire in peace. This is the purpose of life. Uh, and as if people were following that. And this is not too far off, I would say. We find it basically in old handbooks. In old handbooks, for example, uh, in, in uh, ancient India, we have the Dharma Sutras. Uh, Dharma is a very wide uh, kind of idea, but one of the ways to understand Dharma is the law. and the principle. And there is kind of the understanding, these are ideas around the turn of the first millennium, first century CE, something like this, as if each kind of major caste has its purpose, the way of doing things, the way of living, mm -hmm. a standard trajectory, which you should abide, uh, obey to, and then basically you will have fulfilled your purpose, your dharma. So, so, so just to de deconstruct that a little bit, so if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is like in India, when even you're born a Kshatriya, that means you're a warrior class, so you're supposed to be a warrior. You, you're born a Brahmin, then you're supposed to be a priest or in the priesthood, and, and so on. Is that what you're saying? So you follow that? Very roughly, yes. Path. I had some, okay. some pathways laid out, right, right. which year you're supposed to become a student, at which year you're supposed to kind of finish the studenthood and when to enter the family life at what time to retire right. and then to become a renunciate and to go into the forest and so so you're saying our ancestors could have been questioning the same thing and then they got tired of it and then they defined that this is the purpose of life well at least it's it accomplished so uh, until now we said well the purpose of life question is the unusual question it's not the normal question and it's, ah, yes. it's an interesting counterpoint to say that in in the past or in certain cultures, also normality was explicitly defined. Mm. It was not just the things that you perceived people did. There were actual manuals and handbooks and an explicit knowledge like, no, this is what you're supposed to do. They didn't just rely on uh, tradition. I got it. Okay. So that the purpose of life was basically both for, for example, the spiritual seekers and the monastic lifestyle, they had a very different idea of what their purpose is, as well as for the traditional householder, the, the normal worker, working class. Okay, so uh, going back to the beginning, there is already a complexity to the topic of purpose of life, and we didn't even go into the possibilities of what this purpose could be. There is a sandwich there, it's, it's, there is a context to the topic. Today, I would say the biggest, the most important framework is what we started with, which is one, people who feel 
uh, unhappy or uncertain. They're mm -hmm. looking for a purpose of life. And it has become such a buzzword, such an expectation that I should find my vocation and live my life to the fullest and so on, that there is a certain pressure for me to know what my purpose is and to basically be able to put it on my CV. You know, my purpose <laughs> of life, da, da, da. one, two, three. Yeah. That's me. Okay. So it already means that we cannot approach the question without a bias. There is an, expect, an inner pressure, there's an outer pressure and certain kind of conditions to this question, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's supposed to fill a very specific hole. So if you ask me, what's your purpose of life or what's the purpose of life? And I say, well, the purpose of life is to go every Monday and to buy a can of beans. That would not be a proper answer because we expect something more we expect something specific from this answer. I, I would have to be quite far out to, to understand the, the kind of beans as, as a proper answer. No, we want something, what? Something philosophical, something mm -hmm. deep, something existential, something meaningful. So it's a placeholder that invites a certain constellation of topics. Well, don't we, so let's say if I ask you, um, of which, which I used to, right? How do I find purpose of life? How do I find, what am I here for, right? Because too, then too that becomes, what was that? Sorry? It's too fast because we first have to too see, fast. Okay. Uh, we have to understand that not everything is a plausible answer. Mm -hmm. Certain things fall into the basket of what a plausible answer could be at all. So we are not cr entirely creative. This is what I mean. We're already biased when we approach the question without knowing it. We don't, we pretend we're kind of completely open. I look inside or I look to a teacher or I look into the magazine to find the purpose of life. It's already extremely limited of what this could be at all. Okay, so, so, so let's come back to the main question. So first question yes. was, is there a purpose of life, mm -hmm. right? And and I am assuming you're saying there could be, right? Outside of the, okay, normal principles that some ancestors may have set to how life should be lived. Yeah. You're saying there could be. And then what you're saying is, even though there could be a purpose to life, when we look at it, we are biased. So we are not too open at looking at purpose of life. Yes. And our limitation okay. might uh, cause a situation that we miss it, assuming that there is one. Because Which we, we, will, okay, we will miss because we have biased and we are not yes. looking widely enough. Yes, because the public discourse speaks about uh, love and uh, God and eternity. And in reality, it could be that the meaning of life, let's say genetically hardwired is to eat until we die we would already rule that out because the way that we talk about it is focused on very specific themes. But this is very different than what Campbell spoke about in, in this episode, right? Where he's saying- no, We're not there yet. Okay, okay, all right. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you continue, we're almost, okay. So we're almost there, but not there yet. So right. if we assume that there is a purpose of life, it can be, uh, it can be twofold. One, it could be the same for others, uh, for everyone. And the other is that it would be individual. If it's the same for everyone, it would mean, okay, we just have to crack the code of humanity. And basically it would go down to, uh, to, to a theory, to an assumption that it's basically in the genes. It's genetically transmitted. We as humans are just bound to have a specific purpose of life. And uh, some people would argue that. Right, evolutionary biologists might say it's clear. Like the purpose of life is to procreate. That's the whole deal with evolution. So there's a possibility to to approach this question with the idea: okay, what is the purpose of life for everyone? And then, increasingly so, in recent, the most recent history, and specifically from it started kind of in the, the late uh, 1900s 
but increasingly so uh, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, when the question, it got a spin off, no, everyone has to find his, her own purpose of life. Which kind of makes sense, right? Because it's not genetic. I mean, unless you follow a script, right? Like in certain cultures, procreation is uh, important and because of certain historical events that could have happened in certain cultures, right? Um, so, but in other cultures, procreation is not that important and then it becomes an individual choice. And now people are doing individual things, right? They are deciding not to get married. They are deciding not to have kids in many countries in many different cultures. Yes. So what do, how do they then identify a purpose of life if there is one? Right, and this is, uh, yeah, but, but it's problematic, right? It's just, right. you have to acknowledge that the question was not approached in the same way all the time that there was mm -hmm. a large period of time when it was uh, approached in a more um, normative way for everyone. And that now we'll live in a time where it's even difficult to argue that uh, it's very individual. And this is where Com Campbell comes in. He falls mm -hmm. in the way that he speaks, in the way that he argues, he's very much in a new agey mindset, mm -hmm. which, uh, which, came to prominence in the 60s and then became quite popular in the 70s. This is how people talked back then. And he had, uh, in this uh, series of interviews in, uh, in the mid and uh, seven, uh, 80s, he expressed something that fell onto very receptive ears. It was not nothing new that he said. The hippies said it all the time. The gurus of the 60s and 70s, there were gurus before, but when the Westerners kind of uh, got hold of them, they said that all the time. You have to find your inner voice, your inner God, your inner vocation. And Campbell says, follow your own bliss. Yeah. Which How is, do you find your own bliss? Well, that's a different thing then. Yes, but this is where it starts. This is the starting okay. point. And it, it opens up possibilities and it opens up problems, right? We're not the, there yet of how to find it, first have to see that by defining it as an individual problem, right? It's very much an anti-authoritarian approach. By saying everyone has to find their own bliss, their own vocation, their own purpose, it automatically means that you cannot trust anyone with that question unless they can mind read or something. Your truth is not my truth. No, no, no. But you can at least, let's say if these guys are going or, or let's say if I ask you and you tell me how you identified what your inner voice is saying or yes. how you identified your bliss, I think that's what the question is. The question is not for you to tell me what I should do. Right. Well, this is, this is an older question, right? This is the authoritarian way. I asked my dad, I asked my grandfather, the chief of the tribe the mm -hmm. artists, the guru. And they tell me you should do that because I know I tell you, right? So, but then you're right. If we move it into, okay, everyone has their own, but maybe there is an algorithm that is the same for everyone. Mm -hmm. Not the purpose, but maybe there's a way to get there that can be applied to everyone, which means I can write it in a book and sell it as a self-help classic. Maybe that works, right? True. Which opens up the possibility. I think that Campbell falls into that category, right? But I'm just opening up the possibility that uh, maybe it's so that even the algorithms are different for everyone. So that the okay. individuality not only falls into, you know, everyone can have their needs to find their own purpose, but maybe everyone has to find their own way of how to find the purpose. That's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's, now it's kind of a start to sweat already. Yeah, it's, it's too much. It was fun in the beginning and now it's serious. Yeah. I might as well go back to the normal life, the predefined. Right. Interesting, yeah. yes. Which is one of, one of the kind of um, explanations of the different directions that our society go, right? And 
Right now, we live in a wave where people become more conservative. With people, I mean certain parts of society. We want to reduce complexity. All those questions, all those decisions to be made, all this uncertainty. No, let me go back to a way of life where answers were given and it didn't meet everything, but I'm okay with 50%, who cares? Right, because now you have to work to get anywhere, mm -hmm. right? Like you have to, you have to start. Because, and and I agree with you because one of the sessions we had, we, it was Adler or uh, Marcus Aurelius. I don't know which one it was, but I did tell you. I said, okay, in this book, it says the purpose of life is to help other humans and love everyone. Mm -hmm. And my view was, I can't love everyone. It's not possible. I just can't. I judge everyone. That's what I do. Yeah. Um, so I tried to fit into that category and I was like, okay, I'm failing miserably. And then I felt even worse. Yeah. So, um, so you're right, so now you have to identify, uh, yeah, which is, which is a problem. So now you have to identify what your algorithm is to find your own bliss before you can find what your bliss is. And I think that this is where we are right now. I think we have kind of moved on basically in the complexity from the 70s and 80s where it was plausible to give everyone the same, the same kind of handbook of how to do it. That was possible. Uh, so you could say meditate, right? You meditate in this certain way, you create an inner light in your chest area, you let it grow, and then you see what happens. And what happens is kind of, it will tell you the purpose of life. Or you go to a certain, you have to find your guru, right? which was another answer back then. Everyone finds the guru, the guru will tell you, or in the, in the dynamic with the guru, you will find it. Or you do therapy and you will find it. Psychoanalysis, for example. Or you follow your bliss, which is a fancy way of saying, by finding out what is fun to you, you realize what you, how your system is wired, right? And then by slowly applying it, the, it will become more distinct. There will some distinct figure come out of this, some patterns, and you will realize, oh, apparently this is what I'm into and uh, this is what I'm supposed to do. And I admit that sometimes this is what I recommend clients. In truth, I think we are in a more complex situations. Why? Because society has gone through those recommend standard recommendations and it has failed. Why am I saying it has failed? I'm not saying that nobody found any purpose, but the, the broad kind of application of this has not led to an end of the self-help books, has not led to people not going to therapy, therapy anymore. Divorces are as high as, as ever. Economic issues are still there. Like basically the issues are still there, which means the guidebooks and the helps of the past did not help on a systemic level. So I think that, you know, if we look at it a little bit, you know, zoom from the zoomed out position, we have to admit that probably if you want to pursue this question, we also have to take into account that we don't know how to pursue uh, to find the purpose of life. This is so let's say, okay, so, so basically what you're saying is, um, it, it, you know, when people do live the preordained, like, you know, um, procedural life that has been defined, yes. they're somewhat okay. They're somewhat happy. Maybe like, you know, if I take my sister, for example, at the age of uh, 55, 60, mm -hmm. the kid's moving out. Now she's questioning, which is much later uh, in her lifetime than people who are slightly younger who don't have kids yes. and they start questioning, okay, what am I supposed to do? So if you do that, then there is, uh, it's it's a delayed um, questioning of purpose of life, and maybe midlife crisis, whatever we call that. Yes. Um, people who are outside of the normal life who don't follow the prescription of life now are questioning it. But what you're saying is those who are questioning it are mostly questioning it when they are probably not happy. Um, so should they then try to find what makes them happy and try different things? And maybe then they'll fit into something for a few months or a year, and then they have to do it all over again. Is and that how- That's an important point there. Yes, okay. if you pursue that, 
there is failure is guaranteed, I think. Mm -hmm. And the question is, which kind of failure do I want to make? Do I want to make the failure of not trying to be satisfied with 40 or 50 percent and uh, to live with the fantasies of what could I have done, what should I have done, and so on? So the failure of regret. Do I want to pursue the thing knowing that the journey will be painful of searching, searching, sometimes finding, and then the hopes of, oh, now I found the thing, playing cello, that's apparently brings out the energies in me. And then I pursue that. And then as with most other things, uh, the joy declines and it becomes work. And then mm -hmm. I either drop it or I think, no, I have to go to the master cello guru because they will teach me the real way of how to unleash my energies and my potential and so on. So it's struggle, right? Do I want to have right. a struggle? And I would say, honestly, I cannot tell. This is an individual yeah. choice where people have to uh, come to a point where they are able to decide those questions, which needs a lot of maturity. That I'm facing the situation that I'm in and I'm not I'm not afraid, I'm not intimidated by the, by the kind of impact of the question of what should I do, but I can, I'm, I'm mature and responsible enough to say, you know what, I'm not interested in that struggle. Got it. Okay, so, so let, me, let me circle back in terms of how some of the people I observe uh, who don't believe in purpose of life are are doing it. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking you this because then I can, I'm not trying to prescribe or anything, but I'm seeing if this is the right way of doing it. So, mm -hmm. so one of my friends, um, he started doing yoga. Then he got so into yoga that he tried to become the best at yoga. And then after he got to a level where he was really good, then he decided that he likes to cook. So he started cooking. Mm -hmm. Now he's, you know, into cooking a lot, right? So is this the right way of, of doing things? Because he likes something, he does it for a year, two years, then he moves on to something else. He does it for a year, two years, and then he moves on to something else. Is that what you're saying? We should continue to okay, do so until we find? Well, how I would say it now personally, it is the right way if he made that choice. It would okay. not be the right way in my kind of, my standards. It would not be the right way if he fulfills something that some dude or a book or you know a movie told him that this would be the right way for me the biggest yeah. value is i made this decision and i hence i am taking the consequences i'm not okay. waking up in 20 years and thinking why did i listen to this stupid movie i failed okay. my life i should have so as me. long as as long as you feel like doing it so that's what that's what you're saying so it's not like someone comes to me um and says hey do this and then i do that and then i'm like okay now i'm just keeping busy i'm not enjoying yeah. it but i'm keeping busy so you're saying separate it from being busy to are you having fun while you're doing it do you, um, does the journey fulfill you does the journey fulfill you regardless and if, it leads, if it leads to a purpose or not and it Got doesn't it. need to be happy. Fulfillment in the sense of, you know, it is enriching me. It, I think I'm doing something meaningful and there is no result, right? There is nothing. And, and so I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, take off too much of your time, but, and I don't want to simplify this. And mm -hmm. it is not a very, to me, it is not a very satisfying answer either, but tell me if I'm correct in saying this. So what you are telling me is, or, or what, um, what we are arriving at is, that you don't have a purpose to life. What you can do, however, is find what interests you, continue to do that. And then if you get bored, find something else that interests you, continue to do that. And now fill your life in sprints of what makes you happy. So sprints of six months to one year of what makes you happy, keep doing it till it makes you happy, then jump onto something else that makes you happy, jump onto something. So you just keep living these sprints of year, year and a half, two years until you die. This is one thing. interpretation. This is not what I mean. What All I right. mean is you can, you know, after six months, it's get boring. And then I would understand if someone says, you know what, I will stick to the boring. Why would that be though? Because someone says, I'm not interested in the jumping around life. I'm not interested to have six months of joy. For me, there is a value in doing something hard, which is to deal with my frustrations, 
which is to develop a skill in, you know, why not to apply to relationships? Every six months, I have another relationship. And another every six months, I have, I have a different job. I would understand and I would take it as something that resembles a purpose when someone says, you know what, this job is starting to bore me, but I'm in a stage in my life where I'm interested of where this leads me. I can see that. Yeah, I mean, and, and I, you know, in my case also, I apply that, right? Like I get bored after a while, but then I'm like, okay, let me see what else can I do to make it interesting? Yes. Uh, instead of just jumping around, because then you figure out that when you jump around, especially in terms of career, you end up in the same place yeah. in another year and a half. So it's right. not the job, it's probably you. Yeah. Um, okay. 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 So, and to have right. a kind of loop to the beginning, we started with Campbell, right? And his, his formula, follow your bliss, which is basically follow what, what interests you. That would be the most purposeful thing. Looking back kind of on the complex, I would say there is a thing there regardless if you want it or not, there seems to be something, a fabric in the human mind that produces the question of purpose. Mm -hmm. It's not that people, that there are some people who walk around who are completely immune to this question. In some way or another, I think it touches us. When we look back, when we question if we did something right or wrong, when life becomes more empty and we ask ourselves what to do. So this seems to be kind of, baked into our system, this question. And as with so many things that are baked into our system, it makes us sometimes do very stupid things. And the stupid thing- To find the purpose? You're saying we do stupid things to find purpose? We, we do stupid things in applying this pressure that comes from within. The pressure says, ah, okay, find okay. a purpose, find a purpose, right? Yeah, and yeah. Naive and kind of silly in applying this. For example, by just asking a random person or asking a teacher or mm -hmm. asking a book. That mm -hmm. would be a silly thing to do because this doesn't apply to our kind of human mind. Right, right, it's, makes sense. Those formulas just don't work. If I'm happy with a 30% outcome, that's fine. But then again, I'm in a responsible position. Then I have not delegated all my responsibility to another authority. So this is one of the dangers that comes with the, the question of uh, finding a purpose that I'm delegating the authority for what to search or how to search it to other agencies. And you know we see the effects of this in, uh, for example, in the self-help and the self-development circuit. Okay, interesting. So to, to then and to wrap it up, right? Yes. Um, obviously, you're not going to prescribe anything because everyone has to find their find their own thing. But let's say if in I would short... Responsibility. Yeah. Take responsibility for whatever you choose. If you go on a journey, if you jump back and forth, if you switch up for 20 years, if you don't switch anything, take responsibility for that. This would be my important point. So what you're saying is for people who are looking and who are saying, I need to find a purpose of life and, and they're seeking, you know, uh, some people will go on uh, journeys uh, by foot. Some people go to the Himalayas to sit mm -hmm. and meditate. And, you know, I tried to do this uh, with uh, Steve Walensky, the one you recommended. He said mm -hmm. that you need to uh, imagine yourself as energy, vibrations, and different portals. Maybe you'll open a portal. I tried to do that. Probably didn't do it right. And, you know, I was like, okay, nothing's happening, so I moved on. Yes. Um, I tried to love everyone, but you know, I ended up judging them more than I loved them, so that didn't work either. Um, so you know, I'm still still going through, but I'm going through what people have told me to do because I'm not open to saying I don't know what to do. Yes. Um, so maybe I'm missing something. So if, if, if you were to summarize it, basically what you're saying is open yourself up, find what interests you, keep doing it. And then, you know, it's like you keep following a path and then you follow another path and you follow another path until you get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm really enjoying it. And you forget that you're even looking for a purpose of life and you just keep enjoying what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Is that right? This, this is a nice end goal, uh, it's, but it's, that is much more complex. So. I don't think that this end goal is the outcome of the purpose of life kind of question. I think that that, that is the effect of um, a maturity and a satisfaction that comes from many, many sources. 
okay i, I apologize for being vague <laughs> yeah that is that is a bit vague um i would have to listen to this whole conversation once more to see if i picked up okay or um, to put it differently okay. the um this purpose of life theme or the mythology that is connected with that is something that is within us and is a pressure that wants to express itself i don't think that it's by itself is sufficient to uh to trigger a path that really leads to its fulfillment i think the question and the pressure is there i don't think that it leads by itself to an actual uh, satisfaction the satisfaction will okay. come by many many things and the purpose of life question is just one minor thing there it's more the expression of a problem than a part of this solution all right so you're saying the purpose of life question is more of a pressure we are applying to ourselves yes. uh, there is no one purpose that you're so there is you shouldn't think that you're born with a purpose you're born to i don't know do something like um you know invent an electric car like you know yes Elon Musk did. So, you know, those, those are above average outliers, but then for an average person, there is no particular purpose. You just continue doing what you're doing and maybe you find something, maybe you don't find something, but try to not question everything that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis thinking, is this my purpose? Is this what I want yes. to do? That just produces the satisfaction. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So with that, uh, doc, do you want to go into the other topics or I think the video is going to be too long? if you we can let's choose a second one and uh let's wrap the sec second one up and maybe we'll do another one after that okay got it all right so the second one i'm just looking back at my notes uh which one would you want to get into do you want to get into eternity or do you want to get into um brahman yes i would like to to go into the brahman topic because it's closely okay. connected uh to give a little bit of a background uh brahman is uh a philosophical term from ancient Indian uh, literature and philosophy. Um, very briefly, the the oldest kind of layer of text philosophy uh, are the Vedas in ancient India. And after the Vedas, there were two other layers of text and philosophy, which were the Brahmanas. The Brahmanas dealt with rituals, mostly the de details of rituals. And after the Brahmanas, we have the Upanishads, with most which are mostly uh, philosophical. The topic of Brahman, and it's almost impossible to, to think of uh, Brahman in the Indian context without the Atman. They are very often mentioned together, the Atman and the Brahman. They came to prominence in this uh, latest uh, phase of the Vedic texts and the Upanishads. This is where kind of we find those terms just again and again. Atman and Brahman in uh, in a philosophical context. The but the the term of the Brahman comes from the Vedas, so it's much older than that. And originally, it means something like to form, to expand, to grow, something like that. And it was connected with sacred ritualistic speech. So the way that I kind of summarize it for myself, where the term comes from. It's basically transformative speech, which the Vedas were supposed to be. The Vedas were supposed to be the, the um, not magical, but the, the words that bring you uh, satisfaction, because these are the words that the gods want to hear, and they reward you for the poems of the Veda, for the rituals that are connected with it. They reward you with longevity with children with cows and whatever was in fashion back then so this is the root of where brahman comes from in the upanishads it became a much more philosophical and abstract term it became again an empty vessel for the absolute for the everything for the cosmic soul for the ultimate thing to achieve or to identify with all those purely meaningless becoming absolutes. This is the, uh, the, the period of time when it started. To be fair, it's not that kind of absurdly abstract in the Upanishads yet. This is what later teachers made it to be. Where Brahman, you just throw everything aside, everything is Brahman. 
I am Brahman, you are Brahman, the cosmos is Brahman, and the dog is also Brahman, which means absolutely nothing. Right? It's just a, a formula for something that sounds like a drug-induced state where everything is everything. But, but neither did the first one mean anything, right? Like, you know, this, this talks about uh, the words you say to impress God. That makes no sense. Well, you know, there was a certain idea behind that does make sense, which is a, a very specific manipulation of reality. It was not random. You cannot just say a word okay. and then magic happens. Mm -hmm. No, the gods are susceptible to very specific words, to very specific prayers, to very specific rituals, which means you needed uh, specialized people to do that. Not everyone could do that. So mm. I see a scam coming. Well, it's, <laughs> you can call it a scam. Yeah, maybe it's not that wrong, but it screamed for religious professionals. Okay. And certainly uh, justified the Brahmin caste uh, or the profession of, not every Brahmin is a priest, but the profession of the priest to say, look, you need us. Mm. And we can do it. Okay. Right. So it went from it went from uh, Brahman, who is the um, educated professional who can talk to God on your behalf yes. and do rituals yes. to bring you luck, money, happiness, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. Then it went from there to, as you said, philosophical. In which sense, even I think from when Campbell was talking about, he was saying, "We are all living in a Brahman, and yes. we are all um, a Brahman." And you know they were feeding with each other's energy and whatnot. I completely didn't understand that, but it sounded really good when he was talking about it. Yeah. Um, so we're feeding with each other's energy, so on and so forth. And he distinguished, if I'm not mistaken, he distinguished that God is going past God into your own Brahman, mm -hmm. something like that, which also sounded really good, but it didn't make sense to me. Yes. Um, and I would like to emphasize something like that. It doesn't make okay. much sense. Okay, good, good. So, so, let's, so, so it made sense to you or do you kind of get what he was saying? Well, you know, when you, when you hear it, when you read to it, you, you, you get where it's heading. It's becoming, uh, again, you know, it sounds like he's high and he's high on myths. <laughs> he's high on mythology okay. and this kind of mindset and uh -huh. evoking um, a breaking away of barriers right, where the eternal is in me. I don't project on some personal God who has their limitations, right? If it's the, if I'm talking about the, 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 the God of the Old Testament, it's a very specific God. It's not, I cannot project everything on it. The, the Kabbalists did, but if you read through it, it's a jealous God, it's a punishing God, it's a stern God. Also, yes, yeah. loving kind of his selective tribe, punishing everyone else punishing the sinners and so on. It's a specific thing. If you look into the Indian tradition, Krishna is very different. It's a very loving character. Shiva is very different. So what kind of Brahman signifies when we approach this, these kinds of mythologies, it's non-distinct. It's not specific. It doesn't have specific qualities. It rather signifies that there is an absolute vastness behind that, beyond any particulars, the absolute transcendence, right? And then the, um, the spiritual kind of teachers said, well, where is this thing? Of course, you are part of it. Of course, it's part of you. If it's that transcendent, it's within us. And to realize that is one way of finding liberation, moksha, nirvana, whatever. When, there is, when you see that in essence, nothing is distinct from each other and so on and everything is an illusion there are certain consequences that come with this kind of thinking by saying this is the absolute this is kind of what we try to realize ultimately those consequences follow now again what is interesting to me is not so much if it's true or not for me it's like okay who cares for me what is interesting is that this kind of talking this kind of listening somehow feels good yeah, why is that? Yeah, mm -hmm. because it doesn't make full sense. So you said transcendent. You said transcendent energy and it transcends. Yes. What does that even mean? It transcends. Forget it. It means nothing. I'm interested. Why did you feel good listening to it? I have no idea. It sounded like he was getting to something 
but I didn't know what he was getting to. It sounded really good. And after I was done listening to it, I was like, what was he saying about the whole Brahman thing? So I had to listen to it again. It still didn't make, make sense to me. So yes. I don't know. Why did it feel good listening to it? Well, we would, again, kind of from, from a point of mythology or maybe Jungian psychology, we would say it's something that is within us that is responding to such a lingo, to such a talk. Okay, so one sec, don't go any further. So yes. you're saying something within us. So it's definitely not our mind. Or is it our mind? Because I don't understand the concept of a soul. I don't know where it is, well, but the, let's the unconscious. say. You know, the, the, Jungian the unconscious. Uh, unconscious. Got it. Something. So the unconscious is listening through our conscious. So mm -hmm. the conscious gets it. The unconscious says, yep, I like it. Keep listening yeah. to it. Yes. And the unconscious probably understands it, but the conscience makes no sense of it. Right. Which is All right. Of, which is part of the whole deal because if you see how you can find YouTube videos where you have what is called satsangs, where gurus mm -hmm. are talking to their followers or just sit there sometimes and the followers are blissed out, right? And they get mm -hmm. sometimes bombarded with this talk of everything is everything and nothing is everything and the eternal is the nothing and all of the stuff that doesn't really make sense. And they're getting blissed out by that. Okay, now there are certain possibilities of what it could be. It could be a general spiritual kind of experience and it could be a trance. And if you go into kind of hypnotherapy, NLP, all those traditions, uh, the, the recent traditions who cultivate uh, hypnotic trances, mm -hmm. one way to bring people into a trance is to confuse the logical mind. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. So you are either bringing people into trance or you are undoing the trance they're in. Uh, by bringing them into a trance, yes. Okay, by bringing them into a trance. So now what you're saying is you're talking, you're talking, and now they are in a different phase, in a different set of mind, or they're outside the of their regular mind. Right, the understanding mind is like, oh, well, what, yeah. everything is nothing, and then like, I don't know what he's talking about. Capitulate. That sounds good. And then it's like, oh, okay, rests. I don't, no thinking. Ah. I'm just receptive, ah. sitting there. I'm so just, your thinking stops. Yes, that's part of it. Then I think. Okay, is, but yes. what does it mean? So, okay, fine. <laughs> All right. This sounded good too. So the thinking stops, right? So I'm listening to Campbell and he's talking about Brahman and the transcendent energy and energy from the other person coming to him, etc. Uh, sounds really good. I'm completely into it. My thinking possibly stops for 10 seconds or 30 seconds, if at all. Um, but then, all right, so my subconscious picked it up. Now what? I want more. No? Yeah. Let me read the book. Let me hear more about it. He refers to that writer and to that to that. Um, yeah, mythology. the German writer. I forgot his name. He German did refer to Hall, one. For example... Yeah. Right. And it's like, oh, I want, I want more. I want more. I want more of that feeling. This is what I want. So there's nothing to understand. What I'm craving for is this, oh, this blissful emptiness that I had. That feels great. The story is like, if I find, find out more, I will have more access to this emptiness. But actually, it's not necessary. What I'm looking for is the state of mind. It's like, great. Just you know, shower me more with empty talk so that I can bliss out. <laughs> So wait well, one second. So are you saying that when he's talking about it or when even you talk about it sometimes, mm -hmm. you are just relaxing the mind and bringing in emptiness so the mind could be relaxed? Yes. Now, I'm not saying this is everything that is going on. There are certain additional things I can not, you know, there's a certain romantic ideal that comes with that. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, I think, a baked in wish for unification of the mind for, uh, you know, it's something to put it very simply, I get drunk for certain reasons, right? It feels good. Yes, there's a slight euphoria, but I also, for God's sake, I stop thinking that much. Mm -hmm. That is enough to continue to, to drink or to pick up the drinking again. It's just easy. Right. Stop thinking. Right. 
it's not the same. There are kind of additional that the joy of narrative. There is the joy when I get drunk, I, I cannot, I cannot, you know, transport that, that to you, right? When I hear something fascinating about the Brahman and the Atman and Shopmahawa and Shiva and so on, I can tell my friends like, oh, I heard this fantastic talk. Do that, go on this journey with me. Let's hear that together. Let's listen to it and talk about it afterwards. So there are kind of social aspects that are there. It's kind of, it's a nice package that I think it would be worthwhile to kind of dissemble it and to put it together again to see what is the alluring package of these specific myths. Uh, but for the sake of simplicity, I think it's enough to say that obviously there is a satisfaction in listening to it and that we want to repeat this satisfaction. Let's say if you go on a hike or, you know, let's say the hike is very tough, right? Or, you know, one of the times I was really, um, really into a difficult situation and we went snowboarding. And when we were snowboarding, we were really looking out and making sure we do it right because if you slip and fall you're going to get really really hurt so you were fully concentrated on that so you couldn't think of anything else and then at the end of it your body is tired so is the case for hiking or biking in a tough trail but your mind is fresh yeah. and you love it and you want to do it again am i is this the same as listening to these talks well there's similarities the big difference is you don't while you're doing a sportive exhaustion you don't believe that you uh, unlocked some secrets of humanity, right? Which is more the case when you deal with philosophy and spirituality is like, oh, this is, I understand the world now. And I can tell everyone, look, you make this mistake. You think that you're an individual, but in reality, you're everything. So there is kind of- a but We don't know, but, but, but what you're saying is we don't know if that is true or not. Of course we don't know if it's true, it's gibberish. But it has the component of a secret that is not just personal, but is universal. And that is, again, a great fascinating myth that, that kind of is uh, looking through those uh, cracks. It's like, oh. Secret. This is very depressing. I'm really depressed. I thought that I was on to something and now what you're telling me is it was just, just... Campo was just messing with our heads. No, no, no. And okay, he just... Well kind of like calmed us down, made us stop thinking. And we are like, oh, go good, I got something. I can't explain it, but I got something, I think. Well, I think it's, well, he did not deceive you purposefully. Obviously he believed in what he was saying, but I think if, you know, you ask me, I'm not a mythologist and I don't know if these things are true. I'm basically, you know, I'm interested in the mind I'm interested in psychology. And this is for me what is factual. I can see those mechanisms at place. You cannot ask me if beyond that there is something because I cannot tell you. Okay, so as a practicing Buddha, right? Or Buddhist um, that you are, and as you followed a couple of teachings of some of the gurus in, in India and mm -hmm. in different religions, um, they do talk about they do talk about individualism and individuality, which is my own conscience versus um, everything being together, part of one energy and all. You are saying that it is, although it sounds really good, we have no proof or evidence of that. It just sounds good, makes you stop thinking, makes you stop feeling bad for your own self. And then you feel better because you think you're part of society. Well, Leave away the just. Maybe this is the necessary tool, the necessary story, the necessary narrative in order to propel people into a spiritual practice. And why would people be propelled into a spiritual practice? Just to feel better? Well, this, okay, that's a deeper question and uh, which we cannot pursue right now because we have to- Okay, all but right. This might be an interesting question to pursue further, and it connects, of course, to the purpose of life thing, but its I think it stands on its own. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, I do have to tell you, I'm a little bit depressed as we are ending this session because I thought I was on to something, and now you're telling me I wasn't, and I was tricked. I, I don't want but to dissuade you, should... you from anything. I just... Okay. Uh, if there is 
there are some things that can be said with clarity, and I hope that I contributed to that. Okay, so we can end, uh, I think, the session today. Yes, um, give me a little that. bit of a feedback. We got the two components of our conversation today. What did you? Yes. What did you get? So, and what are open questions that you, for yourself or with others you would like to pursue? Right. So, so on purpose of purpose of life, right, or lack thereof. So, I think we got somewhere, and and and, and the good part was we were able to link this to the Brahman question. Mm -hmm. I think there's a little bit more to be talked about, but we linked it very nicely because. In terms of purpose of life or lack thereof, what we said was we need to be open to saying, I don't know. And we need to not pressure ourselves by thinking, oh crap, am I doing what I'm doing? And is, is this the purpose of my life? And I think this question comes more when you are in a life situation where there's death in the family, you get really sick. Um, there is a there is an imminent mortality that you think of. Mm -hmm. At that point, this question comes in addition to when you're unhappy. And all these things can contribute together. So at that point, how do you handle it? I think it's not a one session thing. You have to go through multiple different phases to understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and then coming to the Brahman, it was really interesting what you just said, because I think I liked the point where you said, why did you like it? And I think that's where it, it gave me a little bit of clarity because yes, for the five seconds, 10 seconds, maybe more, I don't know. I didn't think of anything else. I was fully concentrated on it. And I was like, yes, this makes sense. Let me let mm -hmm. me get it. I wasn't thinking about bills. I wasn't thinking about my code not compiling at work. You know, I wasn't thinking of any of that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and then I would go in and read another book and read another book and try to see if I can bring that feeling back. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I can, sometimes I cannot. Um, but then it was also sad to know that it is something that we can philosophically talk about and we don't know if the if the gurus and all like Nisargadatta and all the books that I read of those if they were factual or they were just saying it to make us feel outside of our mind which is another way of relaxing our mind well certainly same it's thing not the, it's not the words that have a, you know it's not like the word apple corresponds to apple in that way, certainly it's wrong because the word Brahman doesn't correlate to anything, you know, it's, or the absolute or the transcendent, there is no equivalent object. So in that sense, those words are empty. Maybe they're functional. And I would argue that they are functional, right? Uh, but it's not in the con con conventional way that usually we refer to something specific. It's a different way of referring to things when it comes to spirituality and uh, this kind of language. Okay, pretty interesting talk. Um, all right, so do you wanna stop the recording now or? Yes, uh, that right. was the outro. Thanks everyone for listening. And we, <laughs> since we didn't come to any answers, we might pick that up <laughs> at another point. Thank you, Amit.